Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder historian, Dr. Lucas Wilder, and when we last left John Brown, he was heading back to Kansas, but he would use this time to prepare for his raid on Harper's Ferry. As Brown traveled back to Kansas, he stopped in Wayne, Ohio, and established a group called the Black Strings because of the black ribbons worn by its members to identify one another. The group would be dedicated to help support the Underground Railroad. Each member was made to sign an agreement that they believed all races should be equal. When Brown got back to Kansas, he found that a massacre of free staters had just occurred, but the governor of the proposed state gave amnesty to both sides, hoping that that would quell the violence. Brown, in retaliation for the massacre, built a stone and wood building near the site where the trading post massacre took place and even helped nurse back to health some of those men wounded in the massacre. He called the building Fort Snyder. At that location, he formed what was called Shubel Morgan's Company, a military unit of about 15 men who signed an agreement against profane language and general indecent behavior. The name came from Brown's alias he was using to escape the authorities. As he and some of his group rode near the Reverend Martin White's home, the man who had killed Brown's son Frederick two years before, a member of the group asked Brown would he like to go talk with him, insinuating that they could kill White. Brown rejected the offer. He would state, People mistake my objects. I would not hurt one hair of his head. I would not go one inch to take his life. I do not harbor the feelings of revenge. I act from principle. My aim and object is to restore human rights. In September 1858, a prominent free stater was indicted for destroying a ballot box. The free stater invaded the town of Paris, Kansas, to destroy the indictment, but couldn't find the papers. Brown was on the outskirts of the town, but did not participate in the raid. Nevertheless, pro-slavery authorities used his close proximity to the raid to put a $500 bounty on Brown's head. By December, Brown had avoided capture. The appearance of an anti-slavery man with word that a Missouri slave was about to be sold to a man in Texas got his attention. On the night of December 20th, Brown led his band of men into Missouri. They freed the slave named Jim Daniels and his family, taking anything predominantly used by the enslaved and anything that the slaves had made. Some of Brown's party ignored Brown's orders and took the slave owner's possessions. Brown then came to another slave owner's home and took his slaves. In all, Brown's party liberated 11 Missouri slaves and brought them into Kansas, but the final destination would be Canada. The Missouri governor would put a $3,000 bounty on Brown's head, and President James Buchanan would add $250 to that sum. Brown's raid into Missouri stoked fears in the hearts of the slave owners of that state. Some sold their slaves, fearing that Brown would invade again and steal them. At least by selling them, they would gain some money. Brown's raid into Missouri calmed a lot of tensions, though. Missourians feared reprisals from Brown, so they opted for less violence, and Kansas was already heading towards becoming a free state, which sent a lot of slave owners out of the proposed state. Brown's liberating raid convinced them to leave. In a discussion with a fellow free stater before leaving for Canada with the 11 former slaves, Brown talked about the history of slavery since the colonial days and insisted that the founding fathers, even the ones who were slaveholders, believed that slavery should one day be abolished. The two men differed on if the slavery issue would result in a war. Brown stated, No, the war is not over. It is a treacherous lull before the storm. We are on the eve of one of the greatest wars in history. For my part, I drew my sword in Kansas when they attacked us, and I will never sheath it until this war is over. While traveling through Kansas, federal soldiers began harassing Brown and his men at one point, they waited in formation across a creek for the party to pass. Brown ordered his 20 men, outnumbered 4 to 1, to dash across the creek and charge them, believing that the Federal soldiers would run, and indeed they did. The Battle of the Spurs was an amazing victory for Brown. During the battle, he took a few prisoners and had them walk while the rest of the party rode on horses or in wagons, but to console them, Brown walked with them and lectured them on the evils of slavery. The prisoners were soon released, and he continued his journey through Nebraska and into Iowa, where Brown thought the Quakers would support his actions. But the violence he had used convinced them to denounce his actions. In Iowa City, a pro-slavery man began speaking in the middle of town, saying, If I could get sight of John Brown, I would shoot him on the spot. I would never let him get a chance to steal any more slaves. Hearing this, Brown walked up to the man and said, My friend, you talk very brave. 
and as you will never have a better opportunity to shoot old Brown than right here and now, you can have a chance. Brown handed him two pistols and invited him to shoot. The pro-slavery speaker handed back the pistols and walked off. The group would then be placed in a boxcar and sent by rail to Chicago, where the detective, Alan Pinkerton, hid them and got them on a train to Detroit. There, Brown put the now twelve former slaves on a ferry to Canada. Along the incredible journey, Daniels' pregnant wife had given birth to a son, whom Daniels would name John Brown Daniels. Tears rolled down Brown's face as he said goodbye to them, having transported them over a thousand miles to freedom. From there, Brown went to Cleveland, an area in a heated debate and upheaval because of the arrest of the Oberlin rescuers. A group of blacks and whites rescued a black man who had been subdued by slave hunters in nearby Oberlin. The rescuers had been charged with violating the fugitive slave law. Brown would give a speech to that town against the fugitive slave law, and then he would travel to New York and then to Concord, Massachusetts, where he delivered a speech to a crowd including Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson. Despite their anti-slavery stances, the people of New England weren't putting forth the money for Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. He kept traveling, trying to garner funds for his planned slave insurrection. He also made a payment for the pikes he had ordered previously. They would be finished and shipped to a secret weapons cache in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. Next, Brown would travel to North Elba for what would be the last time. He hoped to recruit his sons for the Virginia plan. Many of them had sworn off violence ever since Pottawatomie Creek, but Brown was able to convince John Jr., Owen, Oliver, and Watson to join him. However, John Jr. was still not mentally fit for such an attack, since his bout with what people at the time referred to as insanity in 1856. So, Brown sent him on a tour of the North to gather funds, but because of his mental state, John Jr. would gain little from that tour. John Brown would travel throughout the North between Ohio and Pennsylvania, readying his troops, and checking on his supplies, and by July 1859, he was in Harper's Ferry. One of Brown's biographers described the location. Harper's Ferry was a town of some 2,500, situated at the confluence of the Shenandoah River, which ran deep into Virginia, and the Potomac River, which stretched southeast to and beyond Washington, some 60 miles away. Baltimore was 70 miles to the east by rail, and Richmond nearly 170 miles south. Ruggedly beautiful, Harper's Ferry occupied a small peninsula framed by towering cliffs. To the east stood Maryland Heights, more than 1,200 feet tall, and to the west the equally precipitous Loudoun Heights. The business center of Harper's Ferry was a low area built around Shenandoah and Potomac streets. Despite its forbidden terrain, Harper's Ferry was centrally located and historically significant. A hub of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, it was connected to mainland on both sides by long bridges that permitted trains to carry cargo and passengers between the East Coast and Ohio, where rail links opened into the Western Territories. It was George Washington's choice as the site of the United States Armory, which opened in 1796. By the time John Brown arrived there, it had established itself as the largest weapons maker in the South. Hall's Rifle Works, on a small island in the Shenandoah, made over 10,000 stand of arms annually, and nearly 20 times that number were stored in the fenced and gated arsenal on Potomac Street. When Brown got to Harper's Ferry, he met with John Cook, who had been living there for a year, scouting the area, while being a schoolteacher and a canal worker. He had even fallen in love with a local woman and gotten married with a child on the way. Brown then made arrangements to rent a farm, known as the Kennedy Farm, just across the border in Maryland, where he would prepare for the attack on Harper's Ferry. Oliver Owen and another man named Jerry Anderson was with him initially. The farm needed more attendance, so Brown's daughter Anne and Oliver's wife Martha came to help with the housekeeping. Over the next month, his recruits came to the farm, both black and white men, dedicated to the end of slavery and believers in John Brown's principles and objectives to rid the United States of the institution. Brown, under the name Isaac Smith, and Oliver, as well as Cook, explored the region, gathering valuable intelligence about the people and the terrain. Anne would sit for hours on the porch, sewing or reading to keep an eye out for anyone approaching the house. If someone did come by to visit, she would rush the recruits upstairs and only then let the visitor inside, not wanting to raise any suspicion. However, a Miss Huffmaster nearby would make regular visits, and on at least one occasion barged into the house and saw blacks and whites mingling about, but she never went to the authorities. In mid-August, Frederick Douglass would come south and meet Brown in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania at a quarry. 
Brown pleaded for Douglas to join in the raid, as he said, Come with me, Douglas. I will defend you with my life. I want you for a special purpose. When I strike, the bees will begin to swarm, and I shall want you to help hive them. Douglas refused to join, but he was accompanied by a fugitive slave who had been living with the Douglas family named Shields Green. Green opted to stay with Brown and join the fight. That summer, Brown wrote a new Declaration of Independence, one insisting on the freedom of all people and arguing that all people, black and white, man and woman, had a right to full citizenship under the law. He also wrote a statement entitled Vindication of the Invasion, which was to explain why he launched the raid on Harper's Ferry in the event of his death. He explained that the invasion was in accordance with a settled policy and that it was a discriminating blow at slavery, and he affirmed that it was over and above all others right. Brown's plan was getting out into the world. His own recruits were sending letters home describing their plan to invade Virginia, and Cook was spreading rumors about a slave uprising in Harper's Ferry. More surprisingly, a group of Quakers from Iowa that knew Brown wrote to Secretary of War John B. Floyd that John Brown was planning an invasion of Virginia. They would say that they informed Floyd because they feared what would happen to Brown if he attempted the invasion. Floyd didn't think anything of the message and cast it aside. Meanwhile, Brown received nearly 200 Sharps rifles and 950 pikes in September in preparation for the attack. On September 29th, Brown sent Anne and Martha back to North Elba with the time of the attack approaching. By mid-October, Brown had gained one more recruit, bringing his number up to 21 liberators, five of them being black. Three men, including Owen Brown, would remain at the farmhouse to guard the weapons and bring them to a schoolhouse near the town for distribution after the raid. The rest of the group were assigned their posts. They would cut telegraph wires to prevent information from spreading quickly, take prisoners to use as hostages, capture the rifle factory, and liberate slaves in the surrounding countryside. In dramatic fashion, Brown wanted his men to capture Colonel Lewis Washington, the great-grandson of George Washington. They would then force him to hand over the sword presented to his great-grandfather by Frederick the Great to one of Brown's black recruits named Osborne Anderson. All of this was to begin on Sunday, October 16th. That morning, the men held a Bible service and prayed for the Lord's help in freeing the slaves of the South. At 8 p.m., the men started on their journey to Harper's Ferry, and immortality.